Welcome into this Tuesday edition of Hitting Hard with John Chuckery. Today on the show, it's 2003 all over again for the Atlanta Braves. What's the future of Dansby Swanson? And Ebba Katie needs to stay on the field. All next, Hitting Hard with John Chuckery, Locked on Sports Atlanta. This is Hitting Hard with John Chuckery, part of Locked On Sports Atlanta. And it starts now. Hitting Hard is brought to you by Bet Online. We ask you to head to youtube.com, put Locked On Sports Atlanta into your search browser. When you get there, hit that subscribe button, leave us a comment. We are free and available to download on all of your favorite podcast platforms, including Spotify and Odyssey. Leave us a five star review. Amazon Fire and Roku, you can check us out on those platforms as well. And follow me at JMCH316. Well, we avoided talking about this yesterday, but it was 2003 all over again for the Atlanta Braves. Now, for many of you that if they weren't here or don't remember 2003, 2003 was the last time that the Atlanta Braves had won 100 games. They were in the midst of winning all their division titles and things like that, right? That was the last time that they had a 20-game winner on the staff, right? Fast forward and all the similarities. A 20-game winner, 101-win season, right? Your fifth straight division, all this good kind of stuff. And if you remember, 2003 was the Kerry Wood, Mark Pryor, Chicago Cubs that knocked the Braves out of the divisional series. In a series where Andrew Jones went one for 17, Chipper Jones went three for 18, and Gary Sheffield, who at 330 with 125 RBIs for that team, went two for 14. And I'll never forget, as long as I live, Leo Mazzoni after that series, going into the offseason, well, you know, anything can happen in a short series. And it feels like 2003 all over again. Because here's all I saw was, oh, the Phillies are hot, or blah, 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 blah. Phillies aren't hot. The Braves were 14 games better than the Philadelphia Phillies. But it's the same script, right? Actually, remember about 2003, too, Tom Gladden was not on that team. He was already with the New York Mets. But we look at the Braves' offense. One for 14 out of Michael Harris. Austin Riley was one for 15. Dansby was two for 16. One difference is the starting pitching of the Braves. Morton, Freed, and Strider. And by the way, it didn't matter if you started uh, Strider or Freed or Strider or Morton in games three or four because neither one of them could get anything done. Morton, Freed, and Strider had a 14.08 ERA in the games that they pitched. Now, the other part of this as well is the bottom of the order. Remember how we spent so much time talking about Grissom and Harris and Contreras and Ozuna and everybody that the Arcia, right? All the guys that they hit at the bottom of the order, how much production they got out of those guys turning the lineup over, getting Ronnie and Dansby and those guys back up again creating havoc at the bottom of the order, getting on base, allowing Dansby. You know, that's why Dansby was driving in 95 runs or whatever this year. It's because he had all those guys at the bottom of the order. He could drive in, right? In the series against Philadelphia, the seven, eight, and nine hitters for the Atlanta Braves went three for 40. Three for 40 for an 075 batting average. So, look. I don't want to hear about hot team. I don't want to hear about what the Phillies are. I don't want to hear about rust either. Because go look at Max Freed. You know, people are like, well, you know, Max Freed all this time off. You know, he had 10 days off between when he last pitched in the regular season and game two against the Milwaukee Brewers last year, right? He had double digit days off. What did he do? Six innings, three hits, no runs, nine strikeouts. He didn't have Russ last year, so I don't want to hear about Russ this year for Max Freed because he didn't have Russ last year when he was off for 10 days in between starts. They just stunk it up. Let's call it a and, and let me tell you, I don't want to hear about it was a successful season. We were 10 and a half games back. We caught the Mets. We swept them. What difference does it make? You're knocked out of the NLDS. 
You got knocked down the first round of chance you had to play in. You didn't pitch well. You didn't hit. All the things that made this team so good. Didn't do any of it. Didn't get any production out of your main cogs. Ronnie played well. Darno played well. Or Olsen played well. That's about it. You didn't pitch worth of crap. Your starters couldn't do anything in this series. Very, very frustrating. And look, I'll say it, and, and y'all won't probably admit it, this was not a successful season for the Atlanta Braves. I don't care about regular season and regular season numbers and stats. That's fun. That's what it gets to. But this franchise is all about playoff success or the lack thereof. I'm hoping and praying that this is not going to be another 90s run for the Braves where we feel that we came up on the short end of things after every year but one. As magical and fun was, last year was, again, this feels like a kick in the shins for all of it. And I don't care about Philadelphia or how hot they are, and I don't care about the Dodgers. That's a them problem. I care about what the Braves' legacy is. I care about what the Braves do. I don't care about what the Dodgers or the Padres or, you know, the Marlins or whatever do. I care about what the Braves do. And this was an enormously frustrating playoffs to sit through and watch. Because many of your stars didn't perform well. You didn't pitch well. You didn't get the only start you got that was a quality was Kyle Wright, who was fantastic in his start. And again, it didn't matter if you pitched Strider or Morton. Didn't wouldn't have mattered which one of those guys played the game. Neither one of those guys gave you enough. Strider went from throwing 101 miles an hour in the second inning to the home run that Hoskins hit off him in, in that third inning was 93 miles an hour. He wasn't going to last very long and unfortunately went sideways pretty quickly. Then your bullpen still gave up a bunch of runs in that game. Nothing went right. So it's great to sit here and pontificate about, well, we won 100 games. Or, okay, great. We said all the same things here in 2003. We had Chipper in left, Andrew in center, Sheffield in right. Those guys hit over 100 homers and drove in 400 runs that year. Sheffield was like 37 and 123 with a 330 batting average. Javi hit 47 homers that year. No Tom Glavin, didn't matter. We had Hampton, Ortiz, Maddox, this, that, and the other, right? And then they ran into Pryor and Wood, and it was over. Pryor and Wood had 25 strikeouts and 24 and a third with a 1.11 ERA. We made their careers that year in 03. We made them legends in the world of Chicago who didn't get to the World Series that year, but we made them legends in Chicago that year. It's 2003 all over again. All that regular season success and stuff that the Braves have means bupkis right now when you're going to watch Phillies and Padres crank it up out there. Very frustrating. A lot of the same old things. No contact with runners in scoring position. Leaving too many men on base. The bottom of your order didn't give you nothing. Too much inconsistent starting pitching. All kinds of different things that came back and bit the Atlanta Braves. Frustrating. All right, let's talk about our friends over at Bet Online. Listen, BetOnline.net is your number one source for all of your sports wagering information. Look, I know you want to get in on the action, right? We got Georgia off this week, but we got Tech coming up on Thursday. Then we've got Halloween coming up weekend where Georgia's going to be obviously in Jacksonville to take on the Gators. Big rivalry coming up. You want to get in on the world of college football? NBA starts tonight. Hawks start tomorrow. Guess what? You got all of that available to you at betonline.net. So here's the thing to do. Take that mobile device, right? It's super easy. Take your mobile device and head to betonline.net today. Check out all of the information that they have, okay? They got esports. They got betting news. They got stats. They got podcast information. Everything you want to be smarter in the world of sports wagering and information that you need is available at betonline.net. So head there today, take your mobile device, get yourself in on the action. You like football, you want baseball playoffs, basketball, boxing, MMA. Everything is right at your fingertips at betonline.net. Get in on the action. Betonline.net is where the action starts. 
So now as we head into the offseason for the Atlanta Braves, look, the good news is, is that there are very few decisions to make, right? Olsen, Riley, Harris, Strider, so many guys that are locked up, right? They brought Morton back. We know Darno's got another year, right? Contreras is here for a while, right? By and large, you know, Ronnie, Ozzy, by and large, there are very few decisions to make. The one big decision, though, is certainly a spot that could be a glaring hole if the Braves don't get it fixed, and that is what to do with Dansby. Now, we've talked about this on the podcast before, talked about the idea of Dansby and what he's worth or, or this, any other. So this is where I'm at now. As, as I look through the tea leaves and read through everything and just kind of now wrap my arms around the idea since we, you know, since it's 2003 all over again, and we don't have to worry about more Braves playoff baseball. Do I think Dansby Swanson will be back as an Atlanta Brave? Yes, I do believe that. Do I think he's going to play on one of these nine or $10 million contracts that double A gets guys to play for? No. I think this will be the one guy, <laughs> excuse me, that the Braves are going to have to pony up some money for. I, I do believe that he's one of the guys that when you look, you're going to have to put some scratchhole out there. I think it is going to be a contract that averages maybe somewhere in the 18 to $20 million range because he can realistically get that on the open market. And look, guys sometimes pick their free agent times to have their best. Years. Remember Jeff Blauser? Remember that name from, from the past? Now, Dansby scored 99 runs this year with 32 doubles, 25 homers, 96 RBI, 18 steals, hit 277 with a 329 on base. I know he struck out 182 times. Guess what? Welcome to modern day baseball. They all strike out like that. You know, again, as Bob Nightingale said to me a few weeks ago, strikeouts are just kind of accepted in, in the game of baseball nowadays. That's why strikeout numbers don't phase the pitching or batting side. And I'm going to go ahead and predict this, and I predict this months ago, Dansby's going to win the Gold Glove this year. Should have won in 2020, but he's absolutely going to win the Gold Glove this year. He's been outstanding defensively. So here you have a 25 homer, 100 run, 100 RBI, Gold Glove shortstop. That's not going to be nine or ten million dollars on the open market. That's twenty some million dollars out there, and I think he's going to get that. And they may do a contract where he gets more in the early part, a little bit less in the later, or vice versa. Right? They'll come up with some kind of trade number. But I do think when you look at putting Dansby on the open market, I do think that there is something to hometown guy. And let's face it. How many organizations can he go to that are better than this organization? You know, unless you're telling me he's going to the Mets or the Dodgers or somebody like that, he's not going to go to a better organization. I mean, honestly, the Dodgers are the only organization that's really been consistently better than what the Braves have been. So I, I think when you – why would Dan's be – at the prime of his career, even for the money, go play for the White Sox or the Cubs or whatever, some vagabond franchise. So you can eliminate, even if they overpaid him, I think you can eliminate a whole crap ton of organizations in Major League Baseball because I have a feeling that Dansby wants to play for a winner. I do think that there is something to playing for not just your hometown team, but playing for a championship caliber team and being part of a team that won the World Series last year is going to be really good. And I think the fact that when you look at all of the guys that are locked up here in Atlanta, I do think when you talk about free agents, they're going to look at that and say, okay, Braves are going to be good for a while. They got Riley and Olsen and Harris and Strider. They got all those guys and Ronnie and Ozzy. They got all those guys locked up for a long time. They're going to be a pretty good organization. So I do believe now that Dansby will be back. I think you're probably looking at somewhere an AAV of 18 to 20 million. You know, he might take a couple of million dollars less per year to stay in Atlanta. This won't be nine or 10 million. It'll push up forward. And I wonder, I don't think you're going to see more than four or five years out of it. I could very much see four for 80. Five, maybe five for a hundred, somewhere in that range. Maybe five for, you know, 95 or something like that, 98. 
but I think he's going to stay here in Atlanta. Now, one of the names that I want to bring up real quick, too, that I hear a lot about is Jacob deGrom. Well, he's going to opt out and this, that, and the other. Okay, understand a couple of things. Jacob deGrom sure as hell ain't coming here for, he's not opting out of 30 to take a pay cut. Okay, he ain't opting out because that's what he has to do is opt out of 30 something million guaranteed to become a free agent. He's not opting out of 30 to come take 20. Sorry, that's not how that works in Major League Baseball. They don't opt out of 30 million to take less money. They don't do that in the NBA and they certainly don't do it in Major League Baseball. All right, so that's number one. So you want Jacob DeGrom, it's going to cost you some money. Number two is, you know, he's only made 26 starts the last two years. I know how good he is, and I understand multiple times a young winner and this and the other. Let me repeat, though. He's made 26 starts the last two years. His track record the last two years is that he's not healthy. You know, if I can go after a guy that's going to give me 30, 32 starts, that's one thing. But he's made 26 starts in two years. I know how good he looks when he's on the mound, but you know how many wins you get out of Jacob DeGrom when he's off the mound? None. You know how many games that are won by Jacob DeGrom when he doesn't pitch? None. That's the problem. So you have a guy that has got an injury history over the last couple of years. Well, you know, he's got a whole season. Okay, well, he's had a whole season the last couple of years, and he's found himself injured out there. And he's not going to play for $15 million opting out of 30. He doesn't opt out of 30 to take 15. You're going to have to pay him. You're talking about one of those Trevor Bauer kinds of contracts, three and a hundred. Okay, then what are you going to do with the rest of your roster from there? Because somebody's got to go. Because you got Morton's back, Freed is back, Wright is back, Strider's back, and Ian Anderson and Mike Soroka. So which of those guys are you trading away? Which of those guys are you disposing of? Because you're not going to have all of those guys along with Elder and Muller and all those guys and then add DeGrom in the mix. One of those guys, Soroka, Anderson, Freed, Strider, Morton, somebody's going to get traded. No reason to have all those guys on your roster if you sign Jacob DeGrom for, you know, a big contract. So if you're ready for three and 100, because I'm not giving him more than that, I'm not giving Jacob DeGrom more than three years because he can't stay healthy and can't prove that he's been healthy the last not one but two years now where he's made 26 starts in two years. That's less than one season of starts over the last two. So if you think adding three for 100 is going to be the difference for the Braves, maybe so. I think the Braves have enough pitching. They had enough pitching last year. I think they had enough pitching this year. It's just unfortunate that Strider got hurt and couldn't help you out. But somebody would have to go. You got too many guys vying for only a handful of you know starting spots. I, I'd be fine if the Braves didn't get in the DeGrom business. The Braves need to get in the Dansby business, though, okay? Because you are left with a hole. Maybe they would move on Grissom to shortstop. Well, what happened, by the way, too? Everybody tell me he's going out to left field this past season. How many games in left field did he end up playing? Oh, none? Oh, okay, sorry. Uh, I thought he was playing left field. I, I could have sworn the Yale told me he was playing left field this year at some point. You know? But anyway, that's not we'll discuss that for the uh, time out there. But I think the Braves will be in the Dansby business. I think they will lock him up. And they'll, by the way, they said that, uh, Terry McGurk said that they are willing to be a top five payroll. team. They were in the top 10 this year. They're willing to be a top five payroll. Add a contract in like Dansby's, it's going to cost them money. Don't forget, Max Freed's got arbitration. He's probably in the 12 to $14 million range. There's going to be a lot of money added to next year's payroll. But I do believe the, uh, I do believe that the Braves will find a way to get it done with Dan's response. I want to talk about my friends over at Built Bar. Listen, here's what I want you to do. Built.com is the place to go, right? We're all looking for one of those low sugar, low carb, low calorie types of snacks, but you want the high protein with it. Built.com has got the perfect selection of snacks for you. Check out their protein bars. Check out their marshmallow, their protein infused marshmallow uh, uh, puffs that they have. All of it is available at Built.com. So you head there today, go through their extensive menu, Built.com, check out all the different types of snacks that they have. And they're going to be high protein, low sugar, low carb. And when you get that order put together, 
and you get your order and you get to the checkout, I want you to use the promo code LOCKEDON15, L-O-C-K-E-D-O-N, the number one, the number five. Use LOCKEDON15 at checkout and you'll get 15% off your order at Built.com. Simply by using the promo code LOCKEDON15 at checkout. Go through the menu. You're going to love all the different products that they have, all kinds of great flavors. Uh, i got to be honest with you. I mean, the cookies and cream is terrific. The berry is terrific. Right? The coconut is terrific. So check out what they have today at Built.com. Get that order together and use the promo code LOCKEDON15 when you get to check out to save 15% off of your order at Built.com. So one guy that we got to see a lot more of on the Falcons' defense on Sunday was Arnold Ebicady, who is really starting to make a name for himself and starting to get some good production. Now, if you look at Ebicady's numbers as far as his snap percentage over the course of the season, we know Ugandeji has been the starter. Game one, he got 43% of the snaps. Game two, 52%. Went up to 61% in game three. But then it came back down to 42% in game four, but a couple of weeks ago against Tampa, 51%. Then with the Ogundeji injury, 82%. Now, I think they're treating Ebba Katie the way that they like to treat rookies on this team, right? We don't throw him in. We don't rush him in. We don't get ahead of ourselves. We don't put him in bad scenarios and things like that. It's the Richie Grant thing, right? They did this with Richie Grant last year. They didn't really start him. They played him a little bit here. Even Troy Anderson, you know, they worked him in early on special teams, a little bit of defense, and they just work them in over time. Well, that's Ebicady. And because of Ogundeji's injury last week, he played 82% of the snaps. Can I tell you, let's see more of him on the field. Now, I know just the raw stats are not huge. He has one tackle for loss, and he has one quarterback sack on the year. But if you look... Among all rookies in the NFL, he's got the third most pressures with 13 this year. He has the third most quarterback hits this year. Only Grady and Taquan Graham have hit the quarterback more times. And Ebicady has the most knockdowns of a quarterback this season for the Falcons. So there are some things in the metrics and things like that that tell you that Ebicady is starting to figure some things out. And I understand the Falcons' philosophy about the rookies, right? Don't play him too much too early. Don't push him into situations. You know, Dean Pease talked a lot about this last year, especially when it came to Richie Grant, because people are like, you drafted this guy in the second round. Can we see him? Obviously, Ebicady's a second-round pick as well. People are like, I thought second-round players are supposed to start and play for your team. Yes, in theory, that's true. But they don't want to put those guys into bad situations. They want to see those guys develop in other areas. And while I understand, look, teaching him to set the edge, can he help in the run game? Can he drop into coverage if need be? Okay, I get that he's got to learn all those kinds of things, and that's all great. But can I tell you that you need this young pup to line up and go get the quarterback? And we talked about yesterday the fact that the one thing the Falcons need to get back to doing is tackling the quarterback with the ball in his hands. And over the last three weeks, there hasn't been a whole lot of that. And that, that number is starting to trend in the wrong direction. Doesn't mean that, you know, I'm scared or panicked yet about it, but that number is trending the wrong way. If the young pup can line up on the outside and he can get to the quarterback and he can knock him around, knock him down, and even better, do what we always talk about on this show. The one thing we talk a lot about on this show is why it's so important to sack the quarterback is to change down and distance in the NFL. That's where you get teams off of their game is when you change down and distance against them. And Ebicady right now feels like of the guys we have on this roster, it's Ebicady and Grady are the two guys that you feel like that if I need a sack, that's the guys I'm going to go to. So while I understand that the raw numbers of Ebicady aren't outstanding, they're not eye popping. It's not Micah Parsons. He's coming out and gotten five or six sacks in his first handful of games. But if you look at some of the underlying advanced numbers, analytics, sabermetric, metrosexual statistics, and all that kind of thing that people love to dig into, pro football focus grades and stuff like that, and ratings and all that, things are starting to trend in the right direction. 
Does that mean that he's going to start right away when Ogan Deji's back and healthy and ready to go? Probably not. You know, Troy Anderson started because Michael Walker was out, right? But they wanted to work Troy Anderson in, start him on special teams, work him into some plays and things like that. You know how you keep yourself on the field in the NFL? You make plays when you're out there. And I understand the injury last week dictated 82% of the snaps. But the good news is, is that this has been a trend over the last three weeks. Let's hope that that trend doesn't change on Sunday. Because remember, we just said in his first three games, he was trending upward. And then in week four, it came back. But week four to week five to week six, it's trended upward. Let's hope that he continues to stay on the field because the production that you're getting and you see the signs out of this guy, you see why they took him in the second round. You see his pass rush ability. It's not just all raw ability to just go get the quarterback. He's learning some things. When you watch some of the all 22, you're seeing him learning some things, becoming a better football player. Yeah, there are things he'll have to work on. I get that. And, and that's one of the big things that the coaches are always talking about. It's one of the big things Dean Pease is always talking about is not getting on the field and sort of looking or feeling like you're lost out there. But there is something different when it comes to guys who can sack the quarterback. Can I tell you that if you have the raw natural ability to sack the quarterback, that's how you become massively wealthy in the NFL. You, you here's here's two ways you become massively wealthy in the NFL be a first team all NFL quarterback and be a guy that can get you double digit sacks multiple years in a row those two players will make you will make themselves an infinite amount of money so I'm loving what I'm seeing out of Ebikadi early on I want to see that trend continue you know if Ogan Deji's back and he starts the snap percentage will probably come down a little bit but you'd like to see him at least get back in that two-thirds of your plays on defense. And I don't think it's coincidence that the defense played so well last week, mixing in a lot more of Troy Anderson and Arnold Ebicady. Those guys were high draft picks. You're supposed to get production out of them early on. It's not supposed to be in five years they finally start to produce. You expect those guys to come in. And I thought in a game where... They played their best defensive football of the year. I think that was their best defensive performance. I don't think it's coincidence that Anderson and Ebba Katie got a lot of the snaps out there because we've seen a lot of the other guys. We know what Evans and Grant and Hawkins and those guys can do, right? Grady, Taquan, we've seen those guys. But I think infusing Anderson and Ebba Katie more into this defense is a good thing. And hopefully as we move along through the season, Believe it or not, you know, we're not very, we're only, you know, a couple weeks away from pretty much being at the halfway point of the season. You want to see those guys. Remember when Dean Pease last year talked about how they were, you know, only 25, 30% of the playbook and they had to continue to develop and open it and all that kind of stuff. Let's hope that those guys snap percentage, especially Eba Katie, he gets on the field more. Let's hope that we get to see him more and let him do what he does naturally well. Go after the quarterback and go get it. All right, we thank you so much for making Hit and Hard with John Chuck for your first listen every day. We want you to make our NFL key predictions on uh, Fridays on Locked On NFL, your second listen every day. Listen, Locked On's local experts give you the inside scoop on the five biggest games of the NFL weekend, including the Sunday and Monday night games. Plus, you get betting advice from the field's betting experts from Bet Online. Follow NFL key predictions every Friday on Locked On NFL. It's available on the Odyssey app, YouTube, or wherever you get your podcast from. Check us out for free on our YouTube page at Locked On Sports Atlanta. Subscribe and leave us a comment there. Free and available on all of your favorite podcast platforms, including Spotify and Odyssey. Check us out. Five-star review is there. Fire, uh, Amazon Fire and Roku. We are on those platforms now, so be sure to check us out there as well. And follow me at jmch 3 one six. We'll be back with a hump day edition as, believe it or not, Hawks basketball opens the season coming up tomorrow night. Back with you tomorrow. Hitting hard with John Chuckery, Locked on Sports Atlanta. 